This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Ms. Ashraf Gamal from Haukama, it is a pleasure to have you with us. I'm sorry my camera is not working for some reasons, although it's on. Um, okay. Okay, so um, so thank you so much for being with us on this webinar uh, that we are proudly doing with the OECD and the AUB uh, uh, with the participation of uh, Mr. Hashem from Grand Thornton. Uh, now, um, there is, uh, in the, the OECD actually, there is a task force which is uh, uh, organized by the uh, MENA OECD working group. Uh, it's on corporate governance. Uh, and and uh, we have been working over the last maybe more than 10 years actually on, on the area of supporting decision makers in the region uh, on various areas of corporate governance. Um, uh, last year, uh, the OECD has, has launched a report of three years of um, uh, work of, of the uh, task force uh, or the working group, which, in which actually we focus on the area of, of uh, governance and, and focusing more on the area of transparency and disclosure. So today's uh, webinar, we are going to focus, it's a continuation of the work of the MENA OECD working group, uh, in which uh, we will uh, discuss the findings of the report. Uh, as well as uh, uh, comments by experts. So today we are uh, really very lucky to have uh, with us uh, three uh, uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, first one is Fianna uh, Jordan. She is a senior advisor from, uh, on the OECD and she is one of the key driving forces of uh, uh, the task force, uh, uh, the working group which has been uh, working on governance in the region. Uh, so she will be starting by giving us an overview of uh, uh, the key findings of the report uh, focusing on the area of transparency and disclosure. Uh, we also have with us uh, uh, Silvarani uh, uh, Rezia. She is the CEO of EDAS Consulting, uh, but also she uh, is the former Chief Commercial Officer of Borsa Malaysia, so she comes with massive experience uh, on regulation and governance. Uh, we're glad to have her with us. Uh, last but not least, we also have Mr. Hisham Faru. Hisham is the CEO of Grand Thornton in the UAE. Uh, Grand Thornton, of course, is well known in their uh, uh, work in the area of, of governance, auditing, and reporting as well. Uh, so um, the, the seminar will be one hour. Uh, we will uh, uh, have around 40 to 45 minutes of presentation as well as interventions and comments by our uh, uh, panelists. And then uh, we will open the floor for questions and, and, uh, and, and comments uh, by uh, uh, anyone who is participating with us. So thank you for being with us again. And now I hand uh, the microphone to Fianna. Fianna, please go ahead. Thank you, uh, Ashraf, for the kind introduction. I just want to make sure, Sophie, you're ready with the slides um, that I'll be using. Um, it's uh, really fantastic to be here, and I really appreciate the uh, the hosting by uh, Hokama and the AUB. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I believe there's also some old friends uh, in the audience. Um, even if this is my first virtual webinar, it's really an honor uh, to be here with all of you today uh, during these unprecedented and uncertain times um, to discuss a topic that is really fundamental to facilitating access to finance for companies, transparency and disclosure, which is more needed today than ever. Uh, so let's start with the why. Uh, why is this the case? I um, mean, first, given that investors look at corporate governance frameworks and practices making their investment decisions, we know that countries with higher levels of transparency are in a better position to attract finance. Uh, and this is because without relevant and timely dissemination of information to the markets, investors just can't properly evaluate their opportunities and risks. Um, and then companies, of course, uh, need reliable financial information in order to make sound business decisions. Uh, shareholders need accurate and timely disclosure to monitor the company's management. Um, so this is really sort of the key fundamental question of the why. Um, and then in MENA, we have um, we have improved their corporate structure. Fianna, please unmute yourself. Yeah. 
Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, so um, I was just saying, I don't know if you heard the last bit, um, that uh, we have seen that in MENA, uh, the countries have tried to improve their corporate governance structures, but we see gaps in terms of transparency and disclosure, both in terms of regulations and in practice. And we've seen uh, foreign investors citing the quality of disclosure practices in the region as one of the main concerns. So that's, that's the why. Uh, now the what. Uh, Ashraf mentioned it briefly. Uh, but just to put this into context, under the umbrella of the MENA OECD Competitiveness Program, the MENA OECD Working Group on Corporate Governance uh, aims to support reforms in the region using the G20 OECD principles of corporate governance as a benchmark. And a key output of the working group uh, is this report um, on corporate governance in MENA, building a framework for competitiveness and growth, which was released last year. Um, this is something that represents three years of very intensive work collectively with the region, uh, policymakers and practitioners. So I'm very proud today to be able to present, um, to present the chapter on transparency and disclosure. And just to tell you again, I think the objective is always very important. Um, so the idea was to share the rich reform experience emerging from the MENA region which is important to MENA, but also very important to the rest of the world, and to serve as a useful tool for policymakers and stakeholders as they continue to improve on corporate governance. It's a long journey, as we know, all over the world. Uh, so the report focuses on four areas, uh, gender balance and corporate leadership, access to finance, transparency and disclosure, and governance of SOEs. So uh, the chapter on transparency and disclosure um, looks at the legal framework and also the role of regulators, changes, ownership structures, uh, as well as actual practices. So we identify the challenges and come up with policy solutions. And right now, what I will do, because we have very little time, is just to focus on the challenges and the policy options. So first, the why, the what, and now the how. Um, so next slide, Sophie, please. So first, um, 20 companies listed in five jurisdictions. We looked at Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Morocco, Qatar, and the UAE. And the reason you only see 15 companies listed here is because five of them didn't have information available in English. So these are the only 15 that we could, we could look at. And we looked at disclosures in the annual reports and company website. So this may not be representative of the whole region, but at least the analysis helps us uh, to develop a sense of general trends uh, with a few observations that I, that I will share now. So while 12 of the 15 companies um, published their objectives, these objectives were actually not explained clearly enough um, in, uh, for example, um, statements by the chairman and the CEO. Eight of the companies disclosed major ownership, but beneficial ownership is not expressed clearly. In cases where the company's major shareholder is a public sector entity, the beneficial ownership of the state can be inferred, but it is not clear. 13 of the companies disclosed the aggregate amount of remuneration to board members and key executives, and nine disclosed details on remuneration. Only one company in the sample disclosed individual remuneration. Six of the companies provided information about board uh, member qualifications in their annual reports and five on their websites. Um, material related party transactions were disclosed by 12 companies, mainly as part of accounting standards. Seven provided information on the terms of these transactions. Uh, and then financial institutions uh, tend to provide greater detail on material, for, uh, material uh, foreseeable risk factors, but less so non-financial institutions. Uh, six companies published ESG reports, and only two companies uh, did not disclose their governance structure in their annual reports. So this is just a kind of a nutshell uh, just to give you an idea. And what we discovered um, was really that the main areas that really need to be strengthened in the region with regard to transparency and disclosure are um, ownership and related party transactions. And these areas are deeply interconnected since disclosure of ownership requires market participants to be provided with updated information on who may exert influence on the company uh, and this helps them to monitor related party transactions. 
Um, so those are the, the key areas. And now I would just like to get into those a little bit more in depth. Uh, Sophie, please, the next uh, slide. Um, when we look at disclosure of beneficial ownership, um, we see that major shareholders, directors, and listed companies are generally required to make disclosures on their ownership. However, the challenge persists in relation to the identification and disclosure of ultimate beneficial ownership. So that's, that's a concern. And then greater requirements for disclosure of transactions have been introduced in many MENA economies since 2014. However, requirements vary with respect to the method and timing in which related party transactions should be disclosed. Also, the thresholds and the approval by shareholders is not adopted in many MENA jurisdictions. And finally, the definition of related parties uh, varies in the regulation. So in addressing these challenges, um, the, uh, the desirable sort of, uh, next slide, the desirable mix um, of you know, legislation versus voluntary codes, of course, is to be decided by each, each country. Um, but there are a few distinct features uh, which we recommend that should be considered. Uh, for example, uh, considering mandatory regulation in, uh, in cases where there is a low compliance level with voluntary rules. I mean, that seems uh, pretty, pretty obvious. Um, and then consider improving disclosures related to beneficial ownership and related party transactions. Um, also adopting flexible regulation in accordance with the needs of different types of companies, um, depending on if they're SOEs, depending also on the sectors, um, if they're SMEs and the complexity. Um, so these are just some ideas. Of course, the ultimate mix of legislation and voluntary codes is, is really a complex decision and requires a lot of further thinking. Um, also, timely, consistent and effective supervision and enforcement should be ensured. Um, and here we offer some recommendations um, in terms of ensuring that supervisory authorities have operational and financial independence as well as adequate powers for regulators participating. I'm sure you're clapping right now. Um, consider adopting a risk-based supervision approach and then sharing the results of monitoring and action taking against non-compliance. This kind of transparency of the regulatory approach itself gives a lot of credibility also and trust to the regulators. Um, establishing clear channels of conveying information to authorities and organizing awareness raising events. Uh, then in terms of shareholder engagement, uh, this could be strengthened. Um, uh, Sophie, next slide, please, where we detail this a bit more. Um, so here we recommend promoting active shareholder involvement by strengthening investor protection and improving public awareness. Um, also policy alternatives to encourage more active shareholder engagement from institutional investors. This is particularly important in terms of long-term thinking. Um, in terms of uh, full and proper disclosure of ownership structures in line with good practices, it would be important to adopt an accurate, clear and comprehensive definition for starters of beneficial ownership and that it's consistent across all the different rules and regulations. Um, also evaluate the minimum threshold at which disclosure is required. In some, some countries, this can evolve. Also, considering the time periods allowing for mandatory disclosure to ensure that investors receive the information on a timely basis, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this uh, during the discussion. Uh, and then, uh, full and proper disclosure of related party transactions, and here there's a lot of recommendations. I won't go through them all. Just a few examples are requiring immediate disclosure on material transactions in addition to periodic disclosure, where such a requirement is not in place. Uh, again, improving the definition of related party transactions to cover all parties who may exercise direct or indirect control in a transaction. Also, again, considering the threshold for immediate disclosure based on materiality of the transaction. Um, and there's many more, including, of course, the, um, the qualifications and independence of the accounting and auditing profession. Then we look at the importance of ensuring comparability and reliability of disclosed information. And here, of course, internationally recognized uh, standards of reporting, uh, accounting, audit are extremely important uh, and ensuring the high quality uh, external audit. So this is a very quick sweep um, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it uh, here for now. Thank you so much for your attention.
Thank you, Fayanna, for this very extensive presentation. I know, of course, the report is, is, has much more details and much more information, but I think this gives the, our audience some sort of a flavor of what are the key issues that were uh, that came out out of the work of uh, the working group. Uh, um, of course, I, I cannot think of anybody uh, better than Hisham to comment on that. Hisham, of course, as Grant Thornton, they do lots of audits, uh, whether that's on listed companies or non-listed companies. Uh, so, uh, Hisham, I'd like to give you the mic to comment on the key findings of the report and how this actually matches with what you observe on the ground and what are the key issues from your own perspective that, that you see. Uh, Hisham, please, go ahead. Perfect. Dr. Ashraf, thank you. And Fiona, thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here um, and share our insights with everybody. Um, so I think I think the report really addresses a lot of, of, of you know, key, key points um, that are critical in the evolution of corporate governance in the region. Uh, first, I must say that, that, you know, as the report states, I mean, I think the region has come a very long way in the past 10 years in relation to corporate governance and disclosure. Um, so, so there's a definite kind of development that is taking place, and, and I think that is something that, that we should should be appreciative of. Um, you know, the, the, the level of volatility and growth that has been happening in this region has, has been tremendous. Um, and so it's critical to appreciate also how this regulation is developed and changes through this time. So you'll see that that effectively did take place in you know the company law that changed in 2015, the corporate governance regulations in 16, um, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless, where we stand today, and and you know more importantly, being part of, of an international kind of um, you know global world with international standards, we have to continuously kind of up um, the ante of the game and, and ensure that our regulations are meeting uh, these standards. Um, so yes, while there is, for example, you know um, almost all listed companies today, if not all, you know uh, adopt IFRS, and that is that is part of the law today. So yes, disclosures are there. Uh, beneficial ownership the laws are, have been out for two years. So the regulation is out there. Um, and, and I think something that, that Fiona did kind of mention is, is about supervision and enforcement. Um, and I think where today it has to sit is that supervision and enforcement has to come at two levels. One at, at, at the private level, which is at the company level, and two at the regulatory level. Um, and I think these are the changes that we really need to see today. So at the private level or company level, it really has to start from the board. Um, we're seeing a lot of discussions and changing coming from, from the structure of the board itself, uh, the importance of non-executive directors. You know, there's the, if, you, if you look at some of the regulations, let's say out of Hong Kong or the UK, where, where best practice actually is that the chairman of the audit committee is an independent. Uh, and, and I think that gives then greater kind of objectivity to the process. These are the things that really have to come out. The accountability of board members um, is also very, very important. Um, I mean, we do have a challenge here in the Middle East where just like there's a concentration of ownership uh, in a lot of the, the organizations, there's also a con concentration of board members. Um, and I think that also then, you know, limits kind of the, the, the independence or objectivity, particularly when you're mentioning, you know, uh, beneficial ownership or even, you know, rate of prior disclosures or conflicts of interest. So I think, you know, if we focus at a board level from, from oversight, I think you know a lot can be managed because the regulation is there. I think regulations in the region, or for the majority of countries in the region, as the OECD report has has identified, is actually you know 80% if not 90% global best practice. So we have come a very long way. Uh, but I think if we really start putting the accountability on board members, structuring the board in the in, in, in the right process, and there's a lot of of push that is happening, and, th and this can come from you know the diversification that that happens on the board you know having a, a a proper structure in place where you have non-executive directors that are available that are qualified um, and are accessible then i think this will be a, a very very strong step if you look at it from, from the other perspective um which is related to um all right perfect so, so if you look at it from another perspective, which is basically, uh, you know, transparency and regulation, as, as Fiona kind of uh, referred to it, this is also very, very important today. Um, you know, non-compliance, what is happening with non-compliance? Is this non-compliance being actively disclosed? Um, and, and if these reports are, then, you know, what is, what is the method that is taking place? Uh, maybe we haven't seen yet, you know, the level of fines that should be out there. And the disclosure of these fines that are put on these companies, or the or 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 basically, let's say, you know, um, the banning of, of particular directors if if, if non-compliance has occurred. I mean, I think forceful action needs to take place, which, like we've seen in many other jurisdictions, because I think that sends a very very strong message 
um, to the region. And it sends a very strong message for international, uh, you know, foreign investment. Right now, what's happening with COVID and, and, and post-COVID is obviously we've seen, you know, the trading at, at, at our regional markets at the lowest level. Globally, the same thing. But that doesn't mean that there is no dry powder. That doesn't mean that there is no liquidity. There is actually liquidity. And liquidity will go and identify the, the right opportunities. Now, the right opportunities are going to be driven by risk management as well. So if there's the right regulations in place and, and oversight on these regulations or a regular supervision on these regulations, that's how we're going to be attracting foreign investment, which is critical now for our growth and sustainability. So I think, I think these aspects have to be looked at. And maybe the last point as well, um, which, which I'd like to mention, is, is basically on you know, issuing corporate governance reports or, or you know, economic, social and, and governance reports coming out. Uh, I know one or few organizations here in the region have started doing this, but this does go a long way uh, because it does go and shows kind of the commitment, the, the, um, you know, the transparency of the organization itself in communicating with the public. So it's not only interacting with, with, with the shareholders, but interacting with public interest. You know, a lot of the time in the ESG reports, there's actually a calculation of, of, of the social impact of this organization. And then if an organization is going to invest at that level, then you know that they would have taken steps already in their own governance structure to ensure that it's best practice and compliance. So we would like to also see that that is also being pushed and, and, and elevated. Um, and, and, and really the, then that becomes kind of the measuring stick for corporations. So it's not only your stock price, uh, but also you know what is, what is your level of transparency and disclosure in the marketplace. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much, Hisham. I'm sure that there are lots of questions uh, to be addressed regarding these points. Very interesting comments, I, I, uh, I must say. Uh, now, um, also, we are lucky to have uh, Silvarani with us uh, because um, she used to be the Chief Commercial Officer of the Borsa Malaysia, and, and uh, I'm sure that her insights will be very uh, enlightening for our audience. So uh, please, I would like to give you the microphone. And if you can unmute your camera as well, that would be great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, can, can, you, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. yes we can hear uh, you very well. Yeah. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, you know, for giving me an opportunity to be uh, on this panel uh, today. Indeed, uh, I must commend the OECD uh, for this uh, fantastic uh, report for the MENA region. Uh, I've actually been involved in the Asian Roundtable for Corporate Governance for many years now. So I can see some parallel with uh, what actually uh, you know, happened in Asia as well. So um, the recommendations in there are indeed uh, very useful. Um, in Asia, obviously, we found that you know, the OECD principles for corporate governance, as well as you know, uh, the work of the round table that led to white papers and best practices, uh, having been very useful you know, as we actually uh, sought to develop uh, the corporate governance, you know, rules, frameworks, codes, best practices in our respective markets. So I'm sure that in the region, uh, you'll find the report, you know, equally uh, useful uh, as well. And uh, what's interesting is that I think the report is coming about at a time where um, companies have actually significantly impacted uh, by uh, COVID-19. Can I remind yeah. the audience, please, to mute your microphones? Uh, there is a lot of noise coming, so please mute your microphones, please, for the audience. Yeah. Thank you. So the, the, the COVID-19, as I was saying, is indeed uh, unprecedented, right, uh, which uh, has led governments and businesses around the world taking uh, unprecedented uh, measures. Yeah? Uh, and in all of this, um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, investors uh, need to be provided with adequate uh, information. I think, you know, um, the, the, the speakers before me uh, have also emphasized the significance of uh, disclosure uh, in the marketplace. So um, to that extent, um, obviously, uh, you know, uh, the, the COVID-19 and uh, some of the restrictions that come about uh, do pose challenges for uh, both uh, companies as well as, you know, uh, preparers and auditors to um, prepare and disclose uh, you know, financial statements on the one hand. And on the other hand, the challenges for companies to make sure that they continue to provide uh, material information in, with respect to the impact of COVID uh, itself you know, on their uh, respective uh, companies. Yeah? So um, I think this is a, a very significant challenge you know, uh, for companies. And appreciating this challenge, regulators world over 
right, have uh, introduced various uh, flexibilities, right, to, to enable companies uh, to cope with this uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, in Malaysia, for example, uh, regulators have actually uh, given an extension of time for companies to actually disclose their financial statements, so quarterly financial statements, the annual report, uh, as well as the audited financial statements. Um, and I see that also, you know, being undertaken in uh, some of the markets, such as in Singapore, as well uh, as in India. In addition to that, um, regulators have also actually, uh, you know, facilitated virtual uh, meetings. Uh, engagement with shareholders is obviously important, and uh, uh, many companies in Malaysia actually, you know, uh, went ahead and had general meetings online, votings online. So, in a way, I think this also paves the way for greater use of uh, technology and greater participation from uh, shareholders uh, in general meetings uh, moving forward. Now, um, appreciating the fact that you know companies, uh, you know, may have access, may need you know, access to capital uh, very rapidly. Uh, there is also some liberalization given to companies in terms of, you know, some of the capital uh, raising rules. Uh, I think this is another very essential part because uh, many companies will have been adversely affected and will need capital. Uh, so we do see that, uh, you know, as a, as a useful liberalization for companies. Now, a lot of companies may also uh, be financially distressed in this time. And in Malaysia, for example, you've got a rule uh, for disclosure, right, if you trigger certain criteria. So the regulator is also actually given you know, certain flexibilities, in particular exempting uh, certain categories you know, from uh, uh, being a trigger criteria for classification. Uh, and at the same time, also uh, giving companies uh, a longer extension of time right, to be able to actually uh, regularize uh, themselves. Yeah? Now, I think the periodic disclosure is a little bit easier to address, but I think the more challenging part for a lot of companies would be uh, how do they actually assess the impact on their respective companies and what sort of disclosures do they then, you know, uh, make uh, to the investors. Now, what has to be appreciated is that, you know, um, the, the, the COVID-19 situation itself, uh, you know, is, is an evolving uh, situation, right? So facts are, if you like, in a state of flux. So in that kind of a situation, it's very difficult for companies to accurately assess uh, what exactly is the impact on the business, you know, on their operations, on their you know, uh, financial position, as well as, you know, future prospects. But these are the very things where investors, you know, would want to know uh, uh, from the company to aid inform the investments. Now, appreciating the significance of this, uh, regulators uh, world over actually have also uh, ad uh, issued advisory notes uh, to companies, yeah, highlighting the need to ensure that in this uh, critical time, investors are continuing to be provided with uh, what is regarded as material information. To that extent, IOSCO on 29th of May also actually uh, issued a sort of an advisory note uh, to the markets. Okay, so I know it's very challenging. Uh, having been a former regulator myself, I appreciate the challenges uh, that companies uh, may have. But it is very imperative, right, for companies uh, and boards to really assess what exactly is the impact and seek to provide. Uh, as much information as possible. So if, if you can't really quantify it, then at least you know, try and provide uh, factual information, right? Uh, engagement with investors in these sort of times is very, very critical, right? If you don't engage investors uh, and, um, you know, there's, there's, there's actually a vacuum, when results come out and the results are very adverse, you can imagine, right? Uh, the investor reaction towards the company would also be equally adverse, right? So it is very, very important uh, to ensure that there is continuous, uh, you know, engagement with investors in these difficult times. I must say that some of the uh, recommendations, right, are very, very timely. Uh, whilst, of course, you know, COVID-19 may pose some challenges, right, in terms of, you know, uh, moving expeditiously with some of these uh, recommendations. But um, I think some of them are also very, very timely. So, for example, a recommendation one that talks about the need to further develop uh, capital markets and provide access to SMEs is indeed uh, very timely, very critical, given that, you know, um, the devastation that COVID-19 may have had on some of these businesses, the need to raise capital, you know, is even more, uh, you know, significant and essential uh, during uh, uh, this time. Uh, I'm happy to actually also, you know, uh, comment uh, a bit, right, in terms of, you know, uh, the experiences that we've had in our market itself. Um, on disclosure, right, disclosure of beneficial ownership, in Malaysia, we actually require disclosure of ultimate beneficial ownership. Now, that is a challenging area. It's not easy. The laws uh, are, you know, can be put in place, but 
I think as, as was mentioned earlier, uh, the supervision, uh, monitoring and supervision is actually very important to ensure that you know, uh, these rules are in fact uh, practiced. Um, in, in Asia, we came up with a guide, the guide for fighting abusive related party transactions. Uh, so I think that could also be a very useful resource you know, for, company, for countries as they seek to actually uh, revamp and build you know, the respective frameworks uh, in their countries. Now, the SOE reform, which is one of the recommendations, is actually uh, very, very key. I have two observations to make in terms of SOEs. One is, uh, you know, which is also mentioned in the report, the fact that, you know, uh, many of the SOEs in themselves are regulators and hence that sort of a conflict, uh, you know, needs to be addressed as it can actually prevent the development of that particular uh, sector. Second thing is SOEs generally, you know, uh, are in critical industries, right, such as, you know, uh, energy, utilities, yeah? Uh, and this in itself, uh, and monopolies in themselves, as you know, right, uh, may not be uh, as efficient as private sector. So taking a more market-based approach certainly helps. Malaysia actually underwent uh, privatization and significant revamp of the SOEs, which I'm prepared to, you know, uh, share with you uh, if any of the participants, you know, are interested in hearing. So I think I'll stop there, right? And, you know, happy to, you know, uh, take any further questions that you may have. Well, thank you so much for uh, these excellent comments uh, and insights as well. Um, I think one of the questions that came out in, in, in your comments uh, is, is simply now, I know, Fayanna, that this report has been uh, launched last year. So we launched that report based on the three work, uh, years of work that were done before that. But, but I think one of the areas that maybe we need to look back at is simply what disclosures are expected now from companies, listed companies, after this, this crisis or during the crisis? Because again, some of the questions here that came actually is, is, is about this. Now, what else can companies disclose? And this is maybe for you and, and for Sham as well. So now, based on the crisis, what's happening right now, what do we expect companies to disclose further, more than what we suggested before? Fayanna, please. Uh, can you unmute yourself, please? I said, I wish I had the, a crystal ball, uh, Ashraf, but um, I think it's not necessarily so much on what they need to disclose. I think for me, honestly, it's more of the challenge of what Ronnie mentioned, which is the quality of the disclosure, how to ensure with these unprecedented times, um, the quality of audits, you know, the quality uh, and how do you verify this financial information considering the uncertainty um, so for me, it's it's not so much what, but really how do you assess um, these these areas? And maybe you know we have some auditors, I think, that are in the audience, and maybe they can help us uh, to think about this. But for me, that's more the the issue, to be honest. Um, and then I see that also on the regulatory side, regulators are struggling to find a balance between, on the one hand, making sure there's timely disclosure, and on the other hand, uh, being flexible. So how do you ensure that? So I think both, you know, from the regulators have to really find this balance and, and how best to do that. That's one issue. And the other issue is really the quality of audit. Um, yeah. So Sham is coming back to you, uh, the quality of audits. And, and what, I mean, if you advise now a company, if I'm a company advising, asking you to advise us, what else can we disclose, which might not be mandatory, but which will help us to, uh, uh, you know, have better relationship with our shareholders, investors, and the community at large. Uh, so what extra disclosures we can think of, and then how to secure or in, in ensure the quality of the audits in this time where, you know, you cannot visit companies, you cannot see records, and you cannot maybe meet people as well. Uh, what is the best sort of advice in that? Look, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, there's there's a lot there, right? Um, if I look at like just at, at a time box today, there is a very big challenge, um, and there's a very big challenge because yes, we physically can't visit a lot of places. Historically, you know, we would go and physically vouch documentations and so on to complete our audit procedures. A lot of the face-to-face -face discussions take place, and it was a challenge. But it doesn't mean that we couldn't do the work. Um, and I think what was surprising to everyone, equivalently like how we're all sitting right now digitally was that a lot of companies had invested in previous in ERP systems. So we were able to get the information digitally. And I think this is where kind of this gives us, you know, greater hope or, or, or you know, um, a sense of, um, you know, a, a stronger sense of presence for the future. Why? Is because the more and more companies use digital information, 
one that gives me greater access to the transparency of this information and the real time uh, level of this information. A lot of the challenges we had here in the region was this, the information was delayed or lacked. So, so by the time it goes to market, it's no longer relevant. Um, but the more and more we've been pushing what COVID has done is that it's converted everything to become much more digital. That means everything becomes much more real time. Now, yes, it is going to put pressure on, on the way we, we, we perform audits, right? And I think there's been a lot of discussions with the ICAW and with other organizations on actually shifting the direction of, of doing a, a, a kind of, yes, it is a risk-based audit, but you're doing a system risk-based audit. So no longer am I just only auditing your financials, but I'm actually auditing your system in which your financial sits on. Um, and this can be done, of course, remotely. Um, and given, with given access, it can be done remotely. So, so we've seen as, 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 as Grant Thornton that, that we haven't had particular delays in, in reaching, particularly for sophisticated clients or clients that have invested in their structure. I think if you kind of extend that further and say, okay, what disclosures are required today? Um, I think there, there should be quite a bit. And, and what I will share is obviously, you know, um, is, is by choice or by option, but I believe this is what the world will expect, particularly from listed companies. Right? There was one question, for example, in the chat box, which was talking about going concern, which a lot of businesses today have a concern because if you look at, if I take, again, this time box of during COVID, most businesses have dropped their revenue by 90%. They have, they have you know, broken their, their bank kind of uh, covenants. They've breached the, the, the agreements. And so in a black and white world, there's a going concern. But any prudent business would have also looked at COVID and would have created a new strategy. And I would have expected a lot of the boards to have done so already. And what this new strategy could have been is, yes, their investment in technology, they're pivoting their, their market presence, they're looking at their operational efficiency, whatever it may be, because the world post-COVID will definitely be different. And I think if people are willing to, to, to be transparent about some of that, which gives clarity and direction, this information is anyway required internally or required from an auditor perspective. And now, you know, we're seeing a lot of the banks and, you know, and, and guidance from the central bank requesting such information. Uh, but again, if they're taking that to the next step, I think that is going to go a long way in creating a much more open and transparent marketplace, which will attract foreign investment. So not only the standards of, yes, greater disclosure at board levels or better disclosure on, on how business is operating on related parties, but let's actually take the extra step and disclose what our plans are post-COVID um, and really change the market in that manner. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, I mean, I agree with you. It's, it's a very challenging time and it's a moving target, uh, as, as we all know. Now, we have with us actually on the audience, Mr. Jalil Tarif. He is the head of the uh, Arab Federation for Stock Exchanges, and he would like to make a comment. Mr. Jalil, can I invite you to speak, please? Can unmute yourself, please? Mr. Jalil Tarif? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, perfectly, sir. Okay. Go ahead, please. Thank you so much. I, I will not take uh, long of your time. Uh, I'm very happy that uh, you have so far provided us with a very, very important information. Thanks to the uh, to all the speakers. Uh, just I have a brief comment on 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 from the regulatory perspective. To be frank with you, I believe the the the, the current crisis is is putting a lot of pressure uh, on all parties and stakeholders, and I believe also it is it is the right for for investors uh, to understand what's going on in the companies, and this is why it became very important for disclosure at this time in particular. There is a huge need now uh, that. To, if we look at the regulation that we have, I think it's fine in terms of of uh, of, of 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 disclosure, but it's not sufficient. I think there is a need, either, to uh, revise what type of regulation that we have in in the area of disclosure and uh, and uh, and the transparency, or or to to have a certain uh, guide guidelines or a certain uh, commentary provided by either by uh, by international institution like OECD or or locally by by, by regulators to 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 make sure that uh, at this current situation that investors are really 
getting a timely and high quality information with respect to the impact of uh, COVID-19 on, on, the, on the companies and the, not only in the current situation, but as well uh, into the future of the of the of the company which is which is i think uh, another and a huge challenge that we should take in consideration uh, just this point thank you thank you so much mr jalil uh, that, that's really very important uh, and as, as you said i think this is putting pressure on everyone uh, talk about companies boards shareholders uh, creditors suppliers uh, and of course regulators on top of all uh, we also have um, we also have uh, Carmen from the OECD committee. She would like to make a comment. Uh, Carmen, are you, are you with us? Carmen, are you with us? Yeah, hello. Uh, this is Carmen Dinoia. I am deputy chair of the OECD Copaganas Committee and uh, commissioner of the Italian uh, SEC. No, just, I mean, I was uh, uh, very interested in the seminar, very well organized. I'm happy to also to listen to to all these very interesting speakers and uh, especially, you know, uh, I think Mr. Jordan was uh, very convincing. Uh, uh, actually, as also as uh, Salvarani was saying, uh, we are. I'm also part of the Asian Roundtable. You are on a very good, uh, you know, path uh, track. Uh, I think it's very important that uh, really listed companies uh, do believe that what they are doing is good for themselves. Okay. Mm. So in terms of you know corporate governance rules, uh, uh, transparency. The previous question and the comments on disclosure. I mean, disclosure is and disclosing. Uh, is, uh, is is very important because you know and disclosing in a well you know uh, standardized uh, manner as was mentioned before because you know investors they do have to compare markets and so this way can be the way for uh, for all the meta markets which are already there many of you actually are you know exporting capital but actually we are more and more integrated financial markets luckily and especially with the impact of covid i think it's important to be you know attractive attractive because uh, you know, um, behaviors are there, not just, uh, as we always say at the OECD, as an end in itself, but as, as a means to an end, you know, to 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 raise uh, in a more easy way debt and equity in these times, but and in the end to create jobs and growth. So thank you very much. And compliments for the work that you are doing. And I'm happy also that uh, FIAN and the OECD are, are, you know, an important part of it and you are in a very good hands uh, with her. OK, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for the comment. We have also a question from uh, uh, Armstrong, uh, my, uh, Michelle Armstrong. Um, the question is simply, why do uh, there is resistance to uh, disclose, uh, proper disclose, um, uh, uh, ownership and, and retail transaction? I mean, why there is uh, resistance to disclosing all the information about retail party transactions? Why is that? Well, from, I mean, I, as Ronnie mentioned, because I was working before for 14 years with Asia, so I worked uh, with Ronnie actually and others on this guide on related party transactions. And one of the things you see is that, of course, that, you know, there's a lot, it's not that related party transactions are bad in and of themselves, but it's that when they're not disclosed, uh, the abusive ones uh, go ahead without the proper um, checks and balances. And I think given the concentrated ownership structure, you know, related parties in some cases prefer to just sweep this under the rug. So, uh, and then the same thing with the ultimate beneficial ownership. In some cases, uh, this can be ways to, you know, for illicit uh, transactions and uh, other things. But Hisham, Rani, I'm sure you have much more to say on this. Hisham, please go ahead. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf, and, and Michael. Thank you for the question. Um, I think I think you know as a starting point, it is about the concentration of ownership. Um, and while I don't want to say that 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 you know culture is is, is a part of of kind of you know our, our our work ethic, but it's something that we cannot also negate. Um, and I think what is happening is that because of this concentration of ownership, and because the understanding that well you know within the organization there is an awareness of the related parties. So what is then the requirement of the additional disclosure? And I think that is that is the real challenge. It's actually the appreciation of the importance of this disclosure. Um, and how do we kind of educate and provide awareness to the marketplace uh, that, that this level of disclosure actually allows foreign investments to get greater comfort? Because again, you may be investing to, in one entity um, and, and without knowing that there's a related party will cause concern. 
Now, one thing I do want to highlight just on the related parties that, that the region has come a very long way and it's come a very long way from a very interesting angle. What actually allowed greater transparency in related parties was, for example, the introduction of value added tax. So, so when value added tax came in and the legal requirement was the registration of companies either independently or combined based on ownership, that actually allowed clarity on, on, on the ultimate ownership that, that is in the region. That we never really had that sense of, of, of um, insight before, not, not from, from, from a centralized regulatory perspective or even you know, to, to a greater extent, depending on, on um, you know, um, listed companies and, and the accessibility, so even from a banking perspective. Um, so I think as kind of these, these secondary regulations continue to, to kind of come into play, I, I think we will continue evolving and having greater transparency around this. But it does have to start from inside. I think that's that's the most important message. That's correct. Now we have a question actually for uh, Silfarani. Um, uh, it's actually from India. Uh, the question says, how much does compliance play an important role during these tough times? Uh, and will directors be prosecuted for non-compliance uh, if if they are not complying? So that's directly for you, uh, Silva, please. Okay, so uh, okay now so uh, let, let's move to that. I mean another question which was about the boards of directors. I mean, what do we expect from boards to be doing now and what kind of disclosures do we need about boards and what they are doing uh, to make sure that you know shareholders and creditors as well are really you know uh, following up and, and, and assessing what boards are doing, whether that's they're doing the right thing or not. What do we expect from them to do and to disclose? I, from my perspective, um, I think it's it's uh, the risk management strategy, and this ties in a bit to what you were saying earlier about the need for knowing, you know, what's happening in the future and etc. Um, so I think the the board has a huge role to play in uh, in the risk management. We already saw that with the last uh, global financial crisis in 2008. Uh, this was a major issue, and I think this is a key key area. Uh, where we can focus. But I know we also have um, some people in the audience uh, like Turid, uh, who uh, from Norway, uh, who has a lot of experience. She was the head of the Institute of Directors in Norway. So Turid, maybe you have something to say on this. If she hears me. <laughs> hello, hello. Or maybe she just posted a comment and... Uh, I'm here. Hi, Faya. Uh, yeah, did you hear my question? Yes, I did. What do we expect from boards now? Yes. Well, I, I would say we pretty much expect the same as we have uh, at all times that they are, you know, that, that they are uh, hands on on what's happening. Perhaps now they need to be even more closer to uh, the management in the companies and uh, they have to spend more time. And I would say that the most crucial task now is to help the management of the companies to lift their vision and, and look at the long term strategies of the companies while they are, you know, uh, putting out all the day to day fires. And, and also that, that, that gives me the opportunity to, to put in one question because uh, the discussion has been very much around uh, investors and attracting capital. Uh, so I would like to, to hear your reflections on uh, of, of the impact of, uh, of transparency and disclosure on all the stakeholders. So mm -hmm. how do the companies uh, maintain their trust or, or, or build their trust towards the other stakeholders, and especially mm -hmm. in times like this? So yeah, I don't know if that answers your yeah. questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sh should I jump in, Shashwa, for you want to? Yes, actually, because I saw her question, which she was asking about the impact of disclosure uh, on the trust of uh, stakeholders with stakeholders. So, so please, can you tell us why this, this work of disclosure matters for stakeholders? Uh, and please, everyone, uh, mute your microphones, please. Thank you. I think Thanks I think Ronnie you. wanted to answer something. Ronnie, are you there? Yes, sorry. I, I think you know. I uh, you know. I uh, yeah. We missed uh, the question earlier, right? 
Uh, with yes. respect to you know the board uh, and and the roles you know during uh, the the pandemic, if any, I think uh, they are actually you know under you know greater uh, obligation to really ensure that you know there's you know uh, proper oversight you know of uh, their respective companies. So to that extent, uh, I can say that you know in my country in Malaysia, for example, uh, there is no dispensation that has been given. Uh, to directors, right, from discharging their obligations. In fact, to the contrary, uh, the regulators have actually um, sort of sent an advisory note also to say that, look, uh, for example, in the case of audit committees, uh, it is absolutely essential that they ensure the quality of financial statements uh, continue to be maintained. Uh, so it is it is absolutely essential that uh, during these uh, periods, right, the boards are, are, are actually, uh, you know, focusing themselves on the key risk that is being uh, faced by the company and you know how do you then deal with this uh, you know uh, key risk and how do you then plan for the future uh, what are, you know of the strategy and the business plans that have been uh, you know put in uh, where does the company pivot you know from here so um, i do know that many of the boards have been actually extremely busy right and uh, thanks to uh, a lot of the online communication that's available many of them have been extremely busy uh, working over time, looking at some of these issues, yeah. So um, the role of the board in these sort of, you know, uh, times is, you know, uh, absolutely essential and critical. And certainly there is no dispensation in terms of compliance. Another thing I would like to touch on is, you know, uh, there was a gentleman who made a very good suggestion earlier on where he said that uh, perhaps there is a need for guidance you know, to be issued to companies on disclosure. You know, I, I fully agree with that. And having been, you know, a regulator myself, uh, and I can say that the experience in Malaysia has been that these sort of guides uh, are very helpful to companies and does have the effect of raising the quality of disclosures in the market. So in Malaysia, for example, the listing requirements are fairly prescriptive, right, in terms of, you know, providing guidance uh, for uh, disclosure. At the same time, we've also actually issued a guide on disclosure. Right. And if you find that during the COVID period, for example, right, some of the regulators have come up with fairly extensive uh, disclosures. Right. So I've seen some in, in Singapore, in, in India, uh, where uh, uh, you know they, they actually are, are, are quite uh, you know prescriptive in terms of the areas you know that, that serves to provide guidance. But in addition to that, what actually can also uh, serve to enhance the quality of disclosures is really uh, you know training. Training is absolutely essential for the preparers of uh, you know all of these disclosures as well as you know uh, for the board so that you know uh, a strong culture right uh, is is really built and people adhere uh, not purely for the purposes of compliance you know but for the purposes of ensuring that they do provide high quality and meaningful uh, disclosure to the marketplace thank you uh yeah, thank you. yeah. Sorry, did you want me to respond to Turid's question? Yes, please, go ahead. Um, so it's a very good point you raised, Turid, um, because it's something that we're thinking a lot about in terms of our overall uh, work with the region and uh, focusing more on the social dimension and the social inclusion. Um, and I think this concept uh, that you're introducing about the trust of stakeholders and that is incredibly important, uh, I think, especially today. And, you know, normally when we talk about stakeholders and corporate governance, we're talking about creditors, uh, we're talking about employees um, and customers. So that's already a very clear group of stakeholders that would absolutely benefit from the transparency and disclosure. But there is also a broader world out there and uh, absolutely I think there's no disputing that this is absolutely beneficial to build that trust with also them. Uh, yeah, and just, just to follow up on this, uh, Fayanna, and also a question by uh, Ali Harbi, uh, who is asking about the paradigm shift, which is happening now towards sustainability and ESG in the region, and what, uh, what is the momentum of that? Uh, so again, um, I just would like to highlight that, in fact, uh, um, you know, in, in, in the UAE, a couple of months back, uh, the government has launched a new index for ESG, 
uh, which is made by Hawkam and Sandra and Poors. And on the 15th of June, we have a webinar, actually one hour webinar, discuss about the impact of the ESG and what's happening in the region on the ESG disclosures. So those who are interested, please join us there. But meanwhile, there is actually a point that came uh, in one of the comments before, and which was in the report that we have uh, read by the OECD, of course, which is our SOEs. Now, one of the concerns simply now is, is with this crisis, there is a lot of intervention from the states even in the most established established markets happening and of course in the region as well so now you have more role for the state-owned enterprises in the region and even direct government intervention how do you expect this to affect this sort of culture of transparency and disclosure do you think Fianna, from the OECD perspective this would be a challenge or do you think no this can be business as usual please uh, thank you. I mean, I'm not an expert on SOEs, but uh, from my colleagues in that team, they did have actually a discussion on this, and I think they're working on some on some further thinking. Uh, but it's clear that with the state taking uh, a huge role, both as a creditor, but also as possibly as an owner, uh, I think the OECD guidelines on corporate governance of state-owned enterprises are more important than ever. Where, like Ronnie mentioned, you need to really separate the role of the state as a regulator as an owner. So I think there the onus will be very much on the transparency and disclosure of the state <laughs> uh, in terms of, in terms of um, you know, the objectives. I think it's very important, and we, we, we mentioned this in the chapter in the report uh, on SOEs, that it's very, this is one very fundamental issue is to fully understand why do you need the state ownership to begin with? And that's very clear. Uh, and then, of course, in the actual governance of the company and the role of the board and who is appointed on the board, and that this is all very transparent and clear, and that, the, and more importantly, that the company, especially as a listed company, should function as a private company or that should aspire to function as a private company. So I think this is something that the OECD will be looking at very carefully as this is constantly shifting now because we don't know where this is going to go yet. There's already been a huge intervention by the state, but there could be more. So I think there will be a need to monitor this closely. Yeah, we are actually running out of time. Uh, so I just wanted to ask uh, Hisham uh, uh, one, one more question. Um, because based on the OECD sort of, of proposed changes on the policy implications of, of the report, they have this uh, 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 sort of statement about the optimal mix between mandatory and uh, voluntary disclosures. I mean, from your own work as an auditor, uh, what are the things you think that they should actually not be uh, uh, voluntary? They have to be mandatory, which means we need to force companies to disclose that. We cannot just leave it up to them uh, and, and their, their desire to, to disclose. Things which are not now mandatory, which you think that, you know what, based on what's happening, no, they have to disclose these things as well. Look, I think Dr. Ashraf, um, obviously, you know, with, with the international standards and auditing and IFRS, the, the, you know, the disclosures are quite clear uh, from that perspective. And I think most of the companies follow follow through. But I think where we are we are lacking and I think what is, you know, can be pushed further as man mandatory from a corporate governance perspective is, again, coming back to the responsibility on the board. And, and where can we have greater disclosure at board level? So, you know, board member enumeration. You know, right now it is, you know, some, some of the organizations are giving it as an aggregate, as just a lump sum. But what is it per individual? Uh, um, you know, the number of, of different boards that that individual sits on. What is the trainings that have occurred? Uh, the, the appointment process. I mean, there's quite a, there's quite a bit around that, um, that I think if it does become mandatory and, and, and is, is, is pushed an oversight, I think that will then naturally push for the accountability of those board members. Which will then fulfill kind of that that oversight and important cycle, uh, which is driven from from internally in the organization. And I think that would be kind of for me the core focus that would happen here, given the challenges already that many businesses are going through uh, at this time. Okay, one of the questions actually that we got right now, and I think I, we have uh, seen this question happening uh, in different countries. Uh, what so, sort of accountability for corporates that will take advantage of government subsidies and support? Do you think that there should be extra, you know, accountability for these corporates, which will take, you know, these relief programs from the governments, Fianna as well, and, and Hisham, and of course uh, Silva. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, look, I think I think definitely. I mean, what we're seeing is already that the procedures to 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 have access to this, uh, there is there's a significant amount of requirements that the government has put in place. 
Um, and I think this, I mean, intentionally, if, if this is monitored in the right way, then, then it should be that, that companies only with best practice should have access to this uh, to these funds. Um, and I think if, if, if the government or the institutions become the gatekeepers of this, then I think we will actually elevate the marketplace quite significantly. Now, when you come from a reporting perspective, yes, these have to be disclosed very, very clearly, because obviously then this will also, when you know coming to a comparable basis between two companies, this will definitely show a differential. And so we have to also disclose this. John, if you'd like to add something to that? Thanks. Yeah, okay. yeah, I'll just say uh, very quickly, I mean, the, the E20 principles clearly state that that is one of the you know, best practices is to disclose company objectives and non-financial information, um, and that there should be material, you know. So I think uh, there's, no, there's no doubt that this is extremely important, and it depends on the countries whether this is mandatory or not, um, but definitely corporate governance codes which in some cases are comply or explain, sometimes mandatory, sometimes totally voluntary, can also play this role very well um, in addition to listing rules and other, other uh, regulatory forms. But maybe Ronnie has something to add. From, from a you know, uh, regulatory perspective, listed companies are actually under an obligation to make disclosure of you know, material information, right? So if, if if the receipt of you know uh, you know these sort of you know uh, subsidies from the government uh, comes with certain conditions that uh, does have a material impact you know on its uh, either you know its uh, its business uh, its operations or its future prospects or financial condition then uh, naturally you know there is a need to uh, make uh, that disclosure uh, uh, you know uh, to the public and not just a one-time disclosure but as and when you know there are you know, significant developments uh, in that respect they will need to actually make a continuous disclosure uh, so it really depends right uh, on what is the impact of uh, receipt of that sort of you know uh, sub sub uh, subsidy on, on the company so it's all always a question of materiality uh, I think we have gone uh, a few minutes over time. Uh, so uh, again, uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, being with us and staying with us till uh, till the end. Uh, special thanks, of course, to Fayanna for her support, uh, to Rani and to Hisham. Uh, and inshallah, we'll meet you again on the 15th of uh, June for the next webinar on ESG in uh, an investment. Thank you so much. Uh, sorry, Ashraf, can I, can I just say a couple yes. words? Sorry. <laughs> yes, yes, sure you can. Go ahead. Sorry, please. sorry. Before we say goodbye, I wanted to thank you so much in the AUB. And I also just wanted to mention that um, uh, we have in the OECD online a co a COVID hub where there's a lot of valuable analysis on many policy areas. And we also have a MENA note uh, coming out uh, as well as a note on gender and investment uh, in the region. So I think this will be really valuable. Um, and then we are also planning another meeting of the MENA OECD Working Group on Corporate Governance uh, in the coming months, which will look at all of the different uh, recommendations of the report and its implementation. So um, we look forward to working together on this. Yeah. Hisham, any final comments from your side? No, I'd definitely like to thank uh, the OECD for, for the report and their continuous efforts they're doing in the region. Uh, Dr. Ashraf, with all your kind of commitment through Haukama and I think collectively, really changing this and, and Rani of course for her insight so so I'm very happy to be here and thank you all for this. Thank you. Rani, uh, final words from your side? Yes, uh, I'd like to thank uh, you know once again uh, the OECD uh, the opportunity you know to be on this panel. Uh, whilst there are challenges that are being brought by uh, COVID, I think you know, there's certainly an opportunity uh, that you know which we all spoke about in terms of the ability you know to, to, to further develop uh, the markets in this region so you know um, i certainly look forward uh, you know to further growth and uh, uh, prosperity of the mena region and you know i i wish everyone the very best thank you thank you so much and thank you special thanks to the AUB, of course for their continuous support and the work on governance thank you everyone we'll see you in other events inshallah thank you uh, be stay safe okay bye bye thank you Hashem. Thank you. Thank you.